No, as a soldier, apart from your training, during your training, have you ever fired a rifle at somebody? Have you ever killed? I've totally fired a rifle. I've carried a rifle and led troops to go and kill. Have you have you killed? Of course. I wasn't in the army to to uh, as a welfare officer. <laughs> In any case, when I actually went out to fight, it was because we had a choice of either surrendering ourselves to be taken prisoners of war. Where, where was it? That was in Liberia, 1993. Mm. A full-scale war broke out in Liberia in 1989 when Charles Taylor, the then leader of the National Patriotic Front of Liberia, NPFL, in an attempt to assume the reign of power from President Doe, attacked Liberia from his base on the Ivory Coast. The attack was partially successful, and by August of 1990, the Charles Taylor-led NPFL controlled nearly the entire country. At some point, Prince Johnson, one of Charles Taylor's commanders, parted company with his former boss and formed Independent National Patriotic Front of Liberia, INPFL. This was initially set up to unseat President Doe. However, Prince Johnson and his troops later teamed up with President Doe to fight Charles Taylor. The Liberian Civil War raised troubling concern for African states, especially members of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS. Member states feared that if left unchecked, the problem in Liberia will metastasize to other countries in the region. Encouraged by Nigeria, ECOWAS, after some internal wrangles and maneuvers, decided to send a peacekeeping force to Liberia to impose a ceasefire and to end the civil war. The ECOWAS troops, known as the Economic Community of West Africa States Monitoring Group, ECOMOG, arrived in Liberia on August 27, 1990. During the summit of the ECOWAS Standing Committee, Member states had pledged to contribute 4,000 troops, but on August 24, 1990, when the first batch of peacekeepers arrived in Monrovia, ECOMOG had only 2,600 troops drawn from Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. The peacekeeping force was commanded by Lieutenant General Antony Queno from Ghana. The land component of the initial ECOMOG force was comprised of contingents from Gambia which sent one rifle company, Ghana, which sent 1,982 of one infantry battalion, troops armored reconnaissance, a battery of medium mortars, detachments of engineers, and a naval and sea detachment, and Guinea, which sent one infantry battalion, squadron tanks, troops, armored reconnaissance, battery air defense, and three patrol boats. Nigeria contributed one infantry battalion which was later increased to three, one artillery regiment, squadron tanks, one anti-tank company, and a troop reconnaissance. The naval task force included the NNS Ambe, NNS Bama, NNS Danisa, NNS Ekbe, NNS Okui, NNS Siri, and the tugboat. Ghana also sent two naval ships. The air component of the ECOMOC force was initially composed of four Ghanaian Air Force fighter ground attack matches and one F-27 transport plane. Nigeria later sent six Alpha jets and helicopters to replace the aircraft from Ghana. The reaction of the warring faction to peacekeepers differed markedly. President Doe and Yami Johnson welcomed the peacekeeping arrangement and praised ECOWAS for his attempt to restore peace and order in Liberia. Charles Taylor, who all along felt he had an upper hand in the struggle for power in Liberia, stoutly opposed efforts by ECOWAS to mediate the Liberian conflict. He openly declared war on ECOMOG and ordered his troops to attack peacekeepers. Even with the presence of peacekeepers, the warring factions violently opposed each other, maiming and killing whomever stood in their way to power. We passed 3,000. Who then can inside the rebel and then open fire upon me. They kill Boku people there. Me and the cartridge kitchen. Who's saying this happened? Now, yesterday. Yes, 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 yes. Three days complete. Yes, yes, yes. Then we begin again. 18 family then. Where me responsible? Yes, yes, yes. Then, after that Wednesday, we all scatter. 
in Mama and I will all look granny. Thirty days from that sixteen day today where I didn't act so journey. I know you will see me, Mama. All old mommy, you know you will work herself. So here is the dad, eh? You have been caught? You have been caught. Cast it off! You are cast it off! Cast it off! Ladies and gentlemen, I tell you, we we arrested those in America. Who an intelligent man has command over? Early September of 1919, Johnson's henchmen arrested and eventually killed President Doe. The gruesome torture and murder of Doe was videotaped and widely circulated, apparently to convince people that Doe was dead, but more importantly, to warn people of the dangers that would surely befall anybody who opposed Johnson. With Doe out of the way, Johnson's forces directed their sights and guns to Charles Taylor and his NPFL. Ecomog had no selfish interest or stake in the Liberian conflict. Its main and perhaps only goal was restoration of social equilibrium in Liberia. Regrettably, Ecomog troops who came in to maintain peace became targets for attacks from all sides. Peacekeepers quickly became marked men and were forced to defend themselves against limitless and unrestrained violent attacks. Ecomog troops tried with varying degrees of success to achieve the group's mandate in Liberia. They tried to stand between the factions and maintain peace. This turned out to be very problematic as several peace accords were regularly and systematically broken and violated by factional leaders obsessed with achieving their objective of gaining control of the nation's machinery of government. Charles Taylor from the beginning showed little regard for Ecomog. He publicly voiced his contempt for the peacekeeping efforts and accused Nigeria of planning to kill him. These utterances by Charles Taylor did not help matters as thugs fiercely loyal to him were determined to do whatever he asked them to do. Charles Taylor wanted just one thing, power, and the only thing that stood between him and his ambition was Ecomog. I went to Liberia for the first time, 92 June. My tour of duty was supposed to be only six miles because we used to rotate the troops then every six miles. In fact, I even, let me start from the beginning. When the war college, Nigeria decided to have its own war college. A few of us from the army, the navy, and the air force, all of the rank of brigadier generals were sent on course. We did a joint course with the British officer that were to come and open the college. So we came back together with the British team. You know the excitement of being uh, an instructor in the highest military institution. I brought a lot of things to come and make my office look like uh, somebody in such an institution. Finished my office and we were waiting for the opening of the course. I went on a weekend to Makuri, came back, and I was told I was posted to Liberia. And it was rather strange because there were very few that were sent on this attachment. And the intention was for us to work with the British team. So if you had planned that I should go to Liberia, why did you send me on the attachment? General Seni was then my commandant. So I went to tell him that I'm going to Liberia. And he showed a lot of surprise why I should be posted to Liberia. He wanted to go and see General Bacha so that they could, they could uh, stop my posting. I pleaded with him. I said, sir, I know the Nigerian army very well. If I don't go on this posting, the next thing against me will be that I was afraid to go for an operational posting. I went and wiggled my way out. Please do me a favor. Reserve my office for me. I'm only going for six months. I'll come back to the War College to come and teach because of the pride I had in that institution. Who signed your letter of posting? Uh, the military secretary then, General Sh uh, Shagaya. So the order, came, the, the order came from the president? The order was from the chief of army staff. No, it was General Salih Ibrahim. He never liked me. He today. <laughs> My first contact with Liberia was in 1992 when I was appointed the chief of staff of ECOMOG and the Nigerian contingent commander from June 1992 to June 1993. My deployment to Liberia marked a significant turning point in my career. 
Though I had trained for warfare, I had never been to war. I spent most of my time doing what soldiers do in peacetime, training, attending courses, and doing administrative work. But all the while, a part of me had been itching to see combat. So I was excited when I was posted to Liberia. I finally had a chance to practice what I had trained for, a chance to fight. It may well be that after years of doing administrative work, I, in a strange way, needed the thrill of war. As I prepared for Liberia, my mind continued to race with thoughts about the dangers of war and what I had learned at the Nigerian Defense Academy. I went to Liberia and uh, I took over from the then chief of staff of the ECOMOG, but I was supposed to understudy him for two weeks before he would actually hand over to me and uh, I'll take over as a full uh, chief of staff because you need to know the country. You need to know the environment, the deployment of the soldiers, and so on. I was in that state when uh, Prince Johnson, if you remember him, yeah. in fact, he's here with us in Nigeria. Those are the type of stupid things we do, and we cannot explain to anybody except that we are Nigerians. He came, he wanted to take over Morovia by force. He used to be on a place called Cadwell Base which was like a separate country where he was practicing his laws and so on. He was above the laws of the, country, the government of Liberia, killing people every day and doing all sorts of things. So he wanted to, to organize a very, very violent demonstration, which would have probably gotten uh, Dr. Sawyer killed. Well, I had not taken over, but I was still in Liberia, and I was uh, the incoming chief of staff. So I confided with my colleague that I was taking over from. I said, this is not a situation we can accept. To come from Cardwell into Morovia, there's a bridge, which is the bottleneck. And considering the number of people that were with him on arms, and considering the strength of the Ekomog in Morovia, the only place we could hold him was on that bridge. And in those days, other than the Guineans that had some uh, tanks, these old T-55 tanks, the rest of us, especially from Nigeria, all we had was your rifle and two magazines. So we had to call up the Guineans to come and deploy the tanks, and we challenged and dared them to cross the bridge that would destroy everybody. I had not taken over officially. We were there shouting at each other nose to nose, and he saw that we actually meant what we wanted, that what we told him we were going to do, so he withdrew. So by the time I took over from General Mbe as the chief of staff, I had two enemies. Uh, Prince Johnson wouldn't even acknowledge letters written by me, and I was the only person who could write and sign letters on behalf of the ECOMOS because I was the chief of staff. He said that I was only a brigadier, he was a field marshal, that he could barely accept letters coming from General Bakud because he was a major general and that since there was nobody above him. So we became enemies right from that point. So that complicated my job a lot. But it was much, much later on, on October 15, 1993, when Charles Taylor, correction, 1992, when Charles Taylor organized what is very famous now, Operation o Octopus, when he surrounded the Ecomog with over 15,000 men, and were only 3,500. I'm going to explain to you why I had to go and kill, and proudly too. On October 15, 1992, Taylor's MPFL attacked Monrovia. Factional fighting was so intense that I never believed I was going to make it back to Nigeria alive. We took fire from all angles and it was difficult to ascertain who was shooting at us. The warring factions consisted of thugs with no formal military training. These thugs, finding themselves in unsupervised and dangerous situations, unleashed havoc and mayhem on society. Everybody along their way had to be mowed down or butchered 
including women, children, and Ekumog peacekeepers. In the confusion that ensued, Ekumog troops remained calm and displayed extraordinary courage in the face of danger. The battle raged on for four days until Ekumog troops recovered from the shock and started to overpower the NPFL. So we were now in a position of either giving up and surrendering to the rebels or fighting to stay alive. The only place we could maneuver was from the Ekomo base. Have you been to Liberia? No. 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 When you sit in the Ekomo base, if you look back, less than 200 meters is the Atlantic Ocean. So the question of saying you are running to anywhere is not there unless you can swim across an ocean. In any case, we didn't even have boats. So the question of escaping was not there. We had to fight. And if you want to fight safely from a professional point of view, you go aggressive and push the other man. Don't let him be the one pushing you. This was at a point at which, as a brigadier general in the army, I used to carry my rifle. And once they saw me as a very senior officer going out, cooks, steel, tapis, everybody would be encouraged. If the general can do this, we can then they will follow me behind. And my fear used to be that they should not shoot me from the back. We keep praying because it wasn't from the enemy this time. Your threat was from those soldiers that were following you. <laughs> in the end, we succeeded in closing the rebels out of Monrovia. It was when it became obvious to Charles Taylor that he could not assume leadership through violence that he decided to go back to the negotiation table. After one year, when it seemed as if we had achieved our objective, I was posted back to Nigeria. In 1996, I came back to Liberia, this time as the Ekumog Force Commander. Prior to my appointment, Ekumog had been blessed with fine commanders, including Lieutenant General Anthony Queno from Ghana, who served as the first Ekumog Force Commander, Lieutenant General Joshua Dogunyaru who served from September 1990 to February 1991. Lieutenant General Rufus Kupolati, February 1991 to September 1991. Major General Ishaya Bakut, under whom I served briefly as the Chief of Staff, from September 1991 to October 1992. Major General Adetunji Olorin, with whom I served until my posting back to Nigeria in June 1993. He served from October 1992 to October 1993. Brigadier General John Shagaya, October 1993 to December 1993. And Major General John Mark Inyengi, December 1993 to August 1996. Going to war is never an easy task. Having to stand between two mortal enemies bent on killing each other was even more problematic. Liberia presented a unique set of problems. The warring factions consisted of thugs, criminals, and hoodlums who had no respect for human life. They cared only about taking control of the machinery of government by any means necessary. When I received my assignment, intellectually, I felt I could handle it. After all, I had received my training in the art of warfare from some of the finest military minds in the world. Emotionally, however, I entertained some elements of self-doubt. Would I make it out of this alive? What if my troops failed to live up to their training? What about my family? Whatever I felt did not matter very much. I had my orders to move and I had no choice. I put together my belongings, made some phone calls, talked to my wife and family and went to bed. I slept fairly well for some time only to find myself awake and again lost in thoughts. If I failed, my generation and indeed history would be very unkind to me. I quickly numbed such doubts by reminding myself that I had voluntarily chosen to join the army and that war was part of the process and indeed a rite of passage for any soldier who wished to make his mark in battle. If I did well, I could join the exalted rank. These comforting feelings overpowered whatever doubts I had and I dozed off. I woke up the next morning feeling very good. I got ready, packed my suitcase and drove to the airport to board a military aircraft due to convey some supplies to Liberia. The four-hour flight to Liberia was uneventful. I was met at the airport by Brigadier General Mbe, from whom I was to take over 
as Chief of Staff and Nigerian Contingent Commander. After two weeks, I met with military commanders on the ground and reviewed our operations. I had approximately 5,000 soldiers under my command, drawn from different West African countries. I also met with a detachment of soldiers and addressed them on the need to be vigilant. Upon my arrival in Monrovia, I addressed the troops at the Ekomog base. As I addressed them, I took notice of all kinds of expression on their faces, fear, readiness, and determination. Each soldier stood by himself, equipped with the knowledge and training he had received from his country. I didn't expect the level of readiness or discipline to be the same with every soldier since the Ekomog was made up of different West African countries. The curious and concerned look on their faces made me even more determined to give them maximum protection and direction. They should not be needlessly exposed to avoid danger and risk. I saw determined soldiers who were ready to kill or die to bring peace to a troubled land. They looked very calm. I do not know the source of their calmness. It may have been their training that may have prepared them for the mission on hand. It could have been their appreciation of the nobility of their task. Liberia still showed signs of war and civil unrest that have ravaged the former American colony for over 15 years. Factional leaders in their maddening desire to attain power had violated human rights, curtailed liberties and freedoms, and unleashed a reign of terror on their fellow citizens. Armed bandits still roamed the streets. Buildings had been destroyed and the ones standing were covered in bullet holes. Life was unsafe despite efforts by Ecomog to restore social equilibrium. The opportunity to personally witness the horrors of the civil war made me more determined to bring an end to the conflict. I came to Liberia in June of 92 as the organizers had already explained to you. As the chief of staff of the Ecomog, I was also the director of operations. It was at that time, or during that time, that we had the octopus operation. For the first time of my long years of service, I stood at a point at Paul River Bridge. I saw what is called refugees in distress. I was wearing dark glasses. For the first time in my remembrance, tears came out of my eyes. But having come here to serve as an officer at a very high level, and to see how a people, a nice set of people, can go through the type of tremor that you went through, I knew it was absolutely necessary for somebody elsewhere to do whatever it took to help bring peace to this country. The Liberian conflict posed unique challenges. The theater of the conflict consisted of urban areas where innocent civilians found themselves caught between hostile groups. Regular rules of warfare simply would not apply in this case. We had to devise strategies to achieve our objective without unnecessary collateral damage. There were no established front lines or fixed positions. The thugs were scattered all over Liberia, with supply lines running from neighboring countries the rules of warfare simply did not apply. The thugs were not stationed in any particular place. They roamed the cities, striking wherever and whenever they chose. I was, however, determined to push all buttons that would lift Liberia from the cauldron of war and strife and put it on the path to constitutional democracy. This time around, I knew the environment, the key players and their modus operandi. It was therefore much easier for me to quickly assume control of the terrain. Prior to my departure, I issued a press release in Abuja in which I stated that, to the best of my knowledge, security in Liberia was the responsibility of ECOMOG and that no other person or group of persons was supposed to bear arms, especially in the city of Monrovia. I wish to state categorically that in the event of any such Elimination attempt. Ekoma will hit the individuals involved so hard that they will be completely crushed. And I want to emphasize that in the event of any such attempt, we are going to hit such individuals and they will be the ones that will be crushed instead. 
I expected the factions to make reasonable efforts to support the peace plan set forth by ECOWAS. And I'm not going to watch and wait for people to throw stones at me. When you throw stones, I throw bullets. I'm not sure to kill you, but I'm sure to, 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 to maim you. So that next time you don't throw stones at anybody else. I made it known to all faction leaders that ECOMOG had effective retaliatory capacity and would not hesitate to respond to any attacks. I suspected and indeed hoped that Charles Taylor was listening to me. Charles Taylor had a visceral contempt for the peacekeeping mission initiated by ECOWAS. He had long railed against ECOMOG for singling him out for special treatment. The truth was that Charles Taylor, desperate to assume power in Liberia, saw ECOMOG as the only thing standing in his way to power. He therefore resorted to cheap blackmail and veiled threats to undermine and undercut ECOMOG. His complaints arose from personal ambition and greed and lacked substance. I made it clear that ECOMOG would not succumb to his ploy. He became venomously angry when it became clear that ECOMOG would not be deterred by his histrionics. He was therefore determined to undermine the efforts of ECOMOG to restore peace to Liberia. My first order of business was to secure the area by making sure that we took control of the major areas of Monrovia. That done, I set out to disarm the factions. I knew from intelligence and field reports that there were stockpiles of ammunition in different parts of Liberia that were accessible to the factional leaders and their thugs. Unless we got to those arms, they would eventually be turned against my men. In an interview with journalists, I stated the philosophy that animated the military operations. I stated, to disarm, you must be professional and be prepared to give a bloody nose to anybody who tries to subvert the process. Either you are there to enforce peace with all your might, or you leave your troops at the mercy of armed bandits. We have a Ghanaian, a Ghanaian unit in that place that is somewhere distinct from where a, I mean, AFA is fighting. So they're not fighting alongside. Would you be overrun by Taylor's people if you didn't have the backup of the AFL and Ulima River? That is implying that AFL is fighting, I mean, fighting alongside with me, which I've said no. But we have well, seen them right uh, there on the front line with your I'm troops sorry, well behind. That will be the end of the interview. My life and indeed the lives of my troops could not be left to the good faith of voluntary self-restraint on the part of the warring factions not to shoot at us giving their history and the actions of their antecedents, allowing them to retain their weapons would have led to catastrophic consequences for my troops. In your second coming, towards the end, there was this, uh, th there was this news making the round, rumors in the papers, yes. about uh, the Nigerian soldiers, you know, who were supposed to be like a peacekeeping yes. and stuff, were involved with a lot in a lot of looting and a lot of carrying on. Uh. There were no, no, not towards the end of the operations. At a particular point in the ECOMOG, the morale of the troops was so low that they could do anything because nobody was giving attention to them. That was before I went. I took over at a very critical time when these Liberian factions had fought themselves to a standstill. Then I came in. And I came in with a wealth of knowledge, knowing that I had fought in that place for one year. I can close my eyes and draw Liberia and tell you where, where every small town is. Uh, out of respect to my predecessor who was handing over to me, uh, the late General Nenge, who were, by the way, from the same place, I sat attentively and waited for his briefing. I, he was in Liberia for a long time, but I think because he was there in a relatively peace time, he didn't know Liberia as much as I did. So I respected him, took notes and so on. I waited for him to leave. Then I unfolded my own program, or where we stopped when I was serving as the chief of staff to General Luring. And uh, people thought I was crazy. Even Charles Taylor himself. I made a statement here in Nigeria that when I was being interviewed by the press on what I thought I would do differently in Liberia if I went there, I told them, well, to the best of my knowledge, the only recognized security apparatus in that country is ECOMOG, and I'm not going to share that responsibility with anybody. 
So if you have your militia, keep it in your bag. And the Ekoma leaves, then you can take it out. So when we went, we started embarking on cordon and such. And we started with Chastel of, of all people. I remember he called me when his place was raided, thoroughly searched, and we recovered a lot of arms. He said, General Malu, I might not like you, but I respect you. I heard the statement you made in your country about coming to, to uh, take charge of security here. And of all the people here, you started with me. I said, Your Excellency, I have a responsibility to keep you alive. I want to be the person to take responsibility at who is firing at you or me. I want to be able to answer to the ECOWAS authorities that we are in charge of security. And it's for that reason that I'm not sparing anybody. So in your interest, tell your boy, Jeremiah is back. We fought here to kill you. Very likely you escaped. Now it's a different time we'll come for peace. And that peace we're going to bring it to this place. The best the frustrated Charles Taylor and his thugs could do was to sporadically attack Ekomog troops. With time, Ekomog took back the city of Monrovia street by street, building by building. Much as I did not particularly like Charles Taylor, I refrained from personalizing my mission. I was going to even-handedly deal with the warring factions. I made it clear to all concerned that I was not interested in involving myself or my troops in their local politics. I had one job and one job alone, to carry out the ECOMOG mandate of maintaining peace. It did not take long for my resolve to be tested. By October, there was an attempt to assassinate Charles Taylor in the executive mansion. As the first commander, I would have allowed my subordinates, especially the chief of staff and director of operations, to handle the matter. But for some reason, I decided to take over the operation. Within a matter of minutes, approximately 10 minutes actually, we saturated the whole of Monrovia with ECOMOG troops. Residents were surprised by the number of ECOMOG soldiers in Liberia. We used helicopters, ships and land vehicles. My main aim was to keep everybody at a standstill and prevent the warring factions from assessing their arms. Charles Taylor threatened to leave and argued that maybe I had been sent to kill him because of the bad blood between him and the former ECOMO commander, General Oluwin. I knew Charles Taylor too well to allow such a blackmail to derail me. I also suspected that he knew that I was determined to rid Monrovia of the criminal elements and thugs who had threatened the peace and tranquility in Liberia, which had been relatively peaceful until April, when violence had erupted once again. The fighting was in Monrovia. Ekomog withdrew to his base and allowed the factions to sort things out. Good morning, all of you. Morning, sir. I've come again to see you this time, not in such a happy mood like the first and last visit I made when I came on my familiarization visit. I came in precisely this morning to say farewell to you on my redeployment from the ECOMOG back to Nigeria as a general officer commanding one of the divisions. The posting or redeployment took me just unawares like every one of you would have been taken unawares. We have worked together from 22nd of August 1997 when I came here, correction, 22nd of August 1996 when I came here to today. Our expectation was that since our mission both in Liberia and in Sierra Leone terminate by April next year, I was going to get that opportunity of working along with you to finish, hug ourselves, say bye bye to ourselves, exchange our addresses to our various, uh, in our various countries so that we can go out from here together. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Well, life must still go on. On this farewell visit, I took the liberty of coming with both the DSC-1, General Kwarteng, and the Chief of Staff 
uh, General Abduwan. And it was not by mistake that I came with them. The reason is to assure you that the policies that we have been pursuing in our peacekeeping effort, both in Liberia and in Sierra Leone, will not change on my departure from the mission area. We have achieved a lot, and the whole world has commended us. We have to pursue that same policy that enabled us to achieve the measures that we have already reached here in Liberia. I, I came particularly to say thank you to all the officers, all the soldiers of ESOMA. You have made me proud. You have made your countries proud. You have made the ECOWAS proud. The achievement you have made, you have made in the region here, not only in Liberia, but what we are doing currently in Sierra Leone, is something that has never been done before. I know in the process the inconveniences we have gone through. We have lost some of our colleagues. We have been taken ill. We have suffered a lot of uh, humiliation from the same people that we are supposed to be supporting. Those things you should not count them against anybody. That's part of the hazards of military operations. These are things that make the difference between a disciplined soldier and what in my country we call the idle civilian. I'm asking you to redouble your effort. We are already in January. We have only at the end of April by which we hope to be living for our various countries. We have not been able to start the operation in Sierra Leone as we have planned. But the main reason is the delay in the decision of the airport authorities on our movement into Sierra Leone. I'm expecting that within the next couple of days, that order for us to move a march into Sierra Leone will be coming. I want you to do this with all sense of professionalism like you have done here. I can assure you one thing. The Sierra Leoneans are not crazy. If we move into Sierra Leone with the type of force that we have planned for and with the type of equipment that we have already received and that they are on the ground, nobody is going to dare take a shot at you. I know this from experience and I can tell you now that I'm living that that was why we achieved peace here in Liberia. If we had not picked up our strength as we did, if we had not shown that capability, that ruthlessness, that toughness, that if we had not shown that we are capable of firing back and firing effectively, we would have still been sitting here complaining. We demonstrated to the world that the troops of the South region are properly trained, properly equipped, have the will and the determination, they have the guts to deal with anybody. The warrior factions in Liberia saw that and respected us. This is the same attitude we are going to carry into Sierra Leone and we achieve the same major advancement. My regret is that having come this far, I might not have that opportunity of leading you. I feel very bad about that. But as I said, my officers of the high command are all going to still remain there. And this is the main reason why I came with some of them, so that you are sure that ECOMOG is not dismantled. I am just a single person that is going out. And then a word about my successor. He happens to be a colleague, a personal friend, a course mate, somebody we've been together for the past 31 years. I can assure you that the policies we are executing here are the same is going to follow. So he's not going to let us down. He will not let you down. He will not let your countries down. And together we shall not let down the echo. I wouldn't have much to say except to say that in this new year, I wish you everything that you wish for yourself. I wish you God's protection. I wish you God's guidance. And I wish that by the end of every way you are living, I might also have the opportunity of coming to be a part of the celebrations to uh, celebrate with you while you are living Sierra Leone. Thank you very much. 
As I was getting ready to return to Nigeria, I went through the entire gamut of emotions. I remembered the fallen soldiers who had paid the ultimate sacrifice. These were men, fathers, brothers, husbands, and sons who had gallantly obeyed the orders and laid down their lives so their fellow human beings might have a better life. I prayed for them. I asked for God's comfort for their families and asked God to give them the strength and courage to carry on. I thought about the soldiers I was leaving behind, brave men who had left their countries and their families to help ensure peace and freedom in a foreign land. Nothing could be nobler than putting oneself in harm's way so that others might live in freedom. I pray that Almighty God will continue to protect them and grant their commanders the wisdom to make the right decisions. I also thought about the people of Liberia. I remembered ordinary citizens who through no fault of their own had been forced to live in less than satisfactory conditions. I wish that our assignments would lay the foundation for lasting peace in Liberia. Yes, I thought about myself. I thanked God for sparing my life. I was proud of my efforts and achievements. I had helped restore peace and order in a country that had hardly known either before Ecomog troops arrived. I hoped that history and posterity would be kind to me in the assessment of my role in Liberia. I can tell you that not being a Liberian, I've never observed any election that has been conducted so freely and so fairly. But I think I must first commend the Liberians themselves. The orderly manner, the enthusiasm they have shown to come and conduct themselves, stay quietly in line with us sharply, is something I really admire. I believe at the end of it, Liberians themselves would have uh, voted a leader that all of us, including myself, will give the fullest support. So I wish all of you luck. I was also mindful of the facts the revisionists and politicians with an axe to grind will try to distort the facts either in an attempt to discredit me or to gain cheap political advantage. What detractors wrote or said about me was the least of my worries and indeed was of little importance to the people of Liberia who had recaptured their freedom and indeed their humanity.
come here this morning to come and see your faces again and bid you farewell from the mission area. I want to tell you that how proud I am of all of you, the officers and the men, for that cooperation. We succeeded 100% in our mission in Liberia. If you see what people wrote about me in Liberia, now they recognize that Ekomog is not dead. And then my name, I used to be very popular there, maybe in those days. I started talking about General Mao. I almost became like, I used to tell them they're spoiling me. In my country, I'm just an infantry officer. They are making me to feel an important person. Maybe I'll go back and start behaving that way and get myself into trouble. <laughs> it was no longer in my hands. I had played my part with honor and I was going home to my country and my family. As I pondered these thoughts, the words of an editorial written in the Liberian Enquirer, Friday, January 9th, 1998, titled Farewell Malu echoed within me. It reads, General Samuel Victor Malu, the Nigerian general whose name has gone into history for being the first commander of the multinational peacekeeping force that succeeded in disarming the former warring factions in the country, thereby creating the atmosphere for the special July 19th, January and presidential election, has been recalled to take up a new assignment in his country. Indeed, General Malu has left his footprints on the sands of time, that generations to come will forever remember this fine and no-nonsense African soldier. We recall that the outgoing force commander took over helm of affairs of the Ekomok forces weeks after the April 6, 1996 factional fighting, which devastated the city of Monrovia. Shortly upon his takeover, General Malu rebuilt confidence among the factions. Also, he professionally and maturely handled the October 31st assassination attempt on the life of the then councilman Charles Taylor, now president at the executive mansion. Similarly, we note with satisfaction the security modus operandi employed during the electoral process which made the process to become free and fair. Initially, when the campaign started with violence in some areas, the general sent out a strong warning that if you throw stones at others during the campaign, Ekomog will be constrained to throw bullets. This warning sent a clear message to would-be troublemakers, thus making the process go ahead without any major violence. At the same time, the general also built confidence and hope in the electorates in the wake of fear that if some of those who were contesting the polls did not win, they would resort to violence. At that time, the general assured the citizens that they should go about their normal business as no faction had the capacity to wage war after the election as the peacekeepers had been successful in incapacitating all of them. As we wish the general farewell for his dedication, commitment, devotion and sense of purpose and mission, we still recall at one point that we differed with him when he said that the real enemies of the Liberian people were the press. We are now convinced that at the end of his mission, he has now realized that the real enemy of the Liberian people, the press, is only a partner in progress, whose function and role are at times misconstrued by selfish and power-greedy individuals. To General Malu, we say well done for restoring sanity to this country. Well done for disarming the warring factions. Well done for ushering in the first democratically elected government after seven years of war. And lastly, we say well done for being impartial during your mission and tough when it was necessary. In the Liberian way, we say goodbye. Your morale is high. It can't get cold. As the words of the editorial occupied my consciousness, a certain sense of relief overpowered me. My stay in Liberia had made a difference. I had brought peace to a country and provided an enabling environment for elections that ultimately produced and elected a civilian president. All my prior accomplishments paled in comparison to the success I had achieved in Liberia. I had not failed my country. These thoughts provided great comfort and reassurance to me. My troops had performed superbly in Liberia. They had given hope to the hopeless and provided peace. I was not therefore going to allow detractors to cheat me 
or my troops of the well-deserved accolade. The New York Times, writing about my tour of duty in Liberia, observed that, before his arrival, with African soldiers occupying Liberia were degenerating into an antagonistic and resented force that was demanding small bribes, turning a blind eye to looting and letting factions fight on. Since then, General Malu's strict discipline and his tough threats to the faction leaders, the country has calmed down. The highly personal military justice here coupled with statements by many diplomats made it clear that General Malu is the real ruler of Liberia and is almost universally praised for it. The true heroes of ECOMOG operations in Liberia were the soldiers on the front lines, in the streets of Liberia and in the dark alleys of Monrovia, fighting armed bandits and hoodlums who had no qualms about taking innocent lives. They witnessed firsthand the macabre parts of a war fought with brutal and indiscriminating intensity. The ECOMOG soldiers risked everything to contain the warring factions. Some did not survive. Some who survived were scarred physically and emotionally by horrors experienced and witnessed. I suspect, however, that these brave soldiers found an enhanced sense of self-worth and a new meaning for their lives as they helped fellow human beings to live in peace. I remember the words of Anthony Swafford, a retired United States Marine and author of Jarhead, a Marine's chronicle of the Gulf War and other battles, who said, the men who go to war and live are spared for the single purpose of spreading the bad news when they return. The bad news about the way war is fought and why and by whom, and the more men who survive the war, the higher the number of men who might speak. I hope that African countries will learn from the Liberian experience the futility of attempting to resolve political questions through violence. On January 10, 1997, 18 months after I arrived at Liberia as the Air Commander, I boarded the aircraft for Nigeria to assume duties as the General Officer Commanding the 2nd Mechanized Division of the Nigerian Army in Ibadan. I have refused to speculate on why I was not allowed to undertake a complete restructuring of the Liberian Army before I was recalled. Some have insinuated that my frosty relationship with Charles Taylor was a motivating factor. This may have been instigated by Charles Taylor's comment during a trip to Nigeria in December of 1997, when he stated, I don't accuse him of running a parallel government, but I said I would not permit him to run a parallel government. My own feeling is that I don't think the presence of Nigeria has ever encouraged that as far as I'm concerned. There has been an elected government in Liberia. No military personnel in Liberia would disrespect me. I don't think any Nigerian authority will tolerate that, and I have warned that if he did not stop, we would ask that he be recalled or I would expel him. Charles Taylor's rhetoric was nothing more than political posturing designed to whip up sentiments among his supporters. I was unimpressed by his tirades and unmoved by his threats. I had the mandate and support of ECOMOG and was determined to achieve ECOMOG's objectives. I had come to believe that Charles Taylor was a man ruled by greed and loss of power who would revel in my failure or humiliation. I would have been surprised if he had any complimentary thing to say about me. To our friends in the international community, the United Nations, the OAU and ECOWAS, the United States, the European Union, and other friendly governments throughout the world, to the current chairman of ECOWAS, General Sani Bacha and all his predecessors, to ECOMOG and his very strong force commander, General Victor Malu, to the chairman and members, the election commission, we all say a big thank you. But I'll tell you honestly, what we did in Liberia is what put Nigeria on the map. Is what put Nigeria, as much as the Americans and the West hated Abacha, they admired him for that part. And what we need for them, in the Ekoa sub region, Nigeria's population is more than the remaining members put together. So you know the consequences of any instability in any of these countries. By God, God's uh, grace or by stroke of chance, 
We are made to take the leadership because of our number. There is no other armed forces within the sub-region that can send a brigade anywhere. Others believe that my popularity was becoming a source of concern for some back home in Nigeria. Whatever may have been the reason, it did not matter very much. The fact was that I received my deployment orders and I had to obey superior orders. Soldiers do not have much to say about why they are deployed. The key is to do your job very well in whatever setting you find yourself. I took great solace and comfort that I had done my job well. Writing about my performance as ECOMO commander, Nigeria's This Day newspaper of Tuesday, January 20th, 1987, editorialized that by successfully commanding the peacekeeping body, Malu has done Nigeria proud. His performance will without doubt improve Nigeria's rating in the international arena. We congratulate General Malu and the entire ECOMO contingent. It is gratifying that their mission in Liberia ended on a good note. They went, they fought, and they conquered. Upon arriving in Lagos, I issued a statement that clearly captured my sentiments regarding my assignment in Liberia. It reads, Today, Liberia enjoys relative peace and security because of the blood, sweat, and tears of gallant men and women of this sub-region led by our great country, Nigeria. It is a feat which we should all be proud of because it has never been done anywhere else. We have proved to the world that once the will is there, nothing is really impossible. Liberia has settled its leadership peacefully and it is noteworthy that we created an enabling environment for them to do so. It is also my hope that the peace which has been obtained at so high a cost will be preserved by those whom it was now being bequeathed. To fail in nurturing and assuring that peace would be an unforgivable blunder and it would cost that country dearly. Although I would have appreciated an opportunity to complete the restructuring of the armed forces of Liberia as envisaged under the Abuja Agreement for Liberia and also taking ECOMOG troops to Syria alone, I cannot argue against the tide of events. I am confident that my able successor can complete whatever task is left uncompleted. With that statement, I closed the book on my life as ECOMOG commander and turned my attention to my new and very familiar task of serving as the General Officer Commanding of the 2nd Mechanized Division, Ibadan.